Today is March 9th, 2023, and my guest is the poet Dana Joya. He was last here in February of 2021, talking about his book, Studying with Miss Bishop. Dana, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's good to be back. Our topic for today is death, mortality, and impermanence. We're going to look at those topics using a couple of poems from your new collection of poetry, Meet Me at the Lighthouse. And I'm sure we're going to get into some other topics along the way. Uh, let's start with Meet Me at the Lighthouse. Uh, that is the uh, the book, but it's also named after one of the poems. And I'd like you to read it, and uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah, I'll, let me show you. This is a picture, actually, of the entrance of the lighthouse. It is an actual uh, nightclub a rather shabby one that's in Hermosa Beach, California, just outside of Los Angeles. Anybody who's a huge jazz fan will know this nightclub. And this is a poem that takes place there. Everyone in the poem except me is dead. Uh, I'm talking actually to my closest friend growing up, my cousin, who uh, died at 39. This is a place we went together. So it's really a poem to him. I'll mention a lot of names in the poem, Chet, Cannonball, Stan, Jerry. These are the, the names of famous jazz, jazz musicians, Cannonball, Hatterley, uh, Chet Baker, Art Pepper. So don't let them disturb you. The name of the, of the house band at the, uh, at the club was the Lighthouse All-Stars. Meet me at the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach that shabby nightclub on its foggy pier. Let's aim for the summer of 71, when all of our friends were young and immortal. I'll pick up the cover charge, find us a table, and order a round of their watery drinks. Let's savor the smoke of that sinister century, perfume of tobacco in the tangy salt air. Club will be quiet, only ghosts at the bar. So you, old friend, won't feel out of place. You need a night out from that dim subdivision. Tell Dr. Death you'll be home before dawn. The club has booked the best talent in Tartarus. Jerry, Cannonball, Hampton, and Stam. With Chet and Art, those gorgeous greenhorns, the swinging masters of our West Coast soul. Let the all-stars shine from that jerry-built stage. Let their high notes shimmer above the cold waves. Time and the tide are counting the beat. Death, the collector, is keeping the tab. That's really... Lovely. Uh, There's one other reference uh, that might be unfamiliar. It was unfamiliar to me. I, I had a vague idea, but I didn't know precisely which is it's Tartarus. Tartarus. I, I said the club has booked the best talent in Tartarus. Tartarus is the lowest region of kind of the classical, you know, the Gre Greco-Roman hell. So it's the underworld. So uh, I, I have... Uh, no idealistic notions of where these jazz musicians have ended up. You know, they're in the underworld and they're not even the higher echelon. But I, I you know, I liked that line. The club has booked the best talent in Tartarus. Um, well, the, the alliteration talent in Tartarus is nice. Tartarus itself has a incredibly, again, I said, even though I didn't know exactly what it, it was, I knew it was a bad place. I yeah. thought it was hellish. Um, it's well, funny. It reminds me of Cerberus. Yeah, uh, well, the, Cerberus lives in Tartarus. Uh, yeah, I think Cerberus he guards, is, the, guards the gate to it. Um, there's one other allusion in the poem I should probably point out. It's uh, uh, I love to steal great lines and play with them. And it, it, at this visionary moment in W. B. Yeats's Sailing to Be Byzantium, where he imagines these holy men and you know that are kind of in the gold mosaic of a wall he calls them the singing masters of our soul uh and so i have the swinging masters of our west coast soul um 
Well, that's awesome. But anyway, there's a, you know, I stole part of that line, but I, th- I think I, I made it my own. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I, I know that poem, but it didn't, um, yeah, I don't know well enough. Well, that's exactly what I want. I want you to sort of, to, to it to be a kind of faint allusion. You know, I, I believe that really great poetry just necessarily, unavoidably uh, plays off all the poetry that's been written. Because, you know, if I'm reading you a new poem, you've had a lifetime of experience. And so uh, and so you take that experience and you just don't repeat it, but you play with it and you honor the listener's um, lifetime of, of, of experience. And, uh, you know, so this, you know, I've got a, you know, I've, I've got kind of a novel beat. It's an, un, you know, I'm, I'm playing with a, ri- you know, a different rhythm, but I, you know, I'm playing with all sorts of things there because you try to make every line interesting. I will just mention, Dana, that I have the copy. I have your book on, on Kindle, on my Kindle. And while you're reading it, I was following along. And you made a couple of changes, like you did the last time when you read a poem yeah, for well, me. Well, this one actually, I probably changed one line. No Do more have, than it, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the uh, it could be, it could be. It was interesting. I was listening to Bob Dylan last night, a live concert from 1966, and I noticed he played with his lines. Yeah, uh, and I liked that. I said, you know, that's what oral performance is. But this sure. is one I I made a couple of of, of adjustments in the last the last part of the proofs. But, That's crazy. You know, it's, it's um, an oral, or, or, an oral text is like jazz. It always has a little bit of room, but so I just wanted it from memory. So, you know, I, you know, the, uh, That's awesome. Um, I w- let's talk a little bit more about the poem and then I want to talk, we'll move on to talk about, uh, to talk about death, um, and our, um, the challenge of living while knowing that death is uh, in the wings, Dr. Death. Um, so this is written for your cousin who died young. Yes, he was and, a he, well, he grew up next door to me. We were in this little enclave of Sicilian immigrants, and we were the we were the you know the two kids that went to college. And he actually was a dentist. He had a, got a brain tumor. He had two small kids. But growing up, I saw him every day. We went to the same school, the same church, same high school. We hitchhiked to the beach together. So we were like brothers. And and uh, I th- thought that he needed a night out. I, I mean, that sounds <laughs> odd. I mean, th- let me be really clear about this, uh, Ross. You know, uh, you know, I I believe in a metaphysical realm of existence. Now. It could be external or it could be entirely internal, you know, but, you know, I believe there's a continuity between the living and the dead. You know, I, you know, I pray for my parents, you know, I lost a son when I, in my first son, you know, died. And so, uh, you know, I carry the dead with me and, you know, I still talk to my mother and she talks back. <laughs> you know, so, and, and I would consider it an impoverishment. You know, for me to lose my son, my dad, my, you know, my mother, my cousin, my many friends. And so it's, a you know, I mean, that's, it's it's very un-American. Americans tend to say you shouldn't think about death. Oh, that's morbid. Uh, But I don't think it's at all. I think it it makes my life more interesting. Well, the other motto is um, move on. And (laughs) um, it's a very strange idea that you should leave behind the people who made you who you are, who formed you, who, and, and, and for me, I think of, I, I have a different metaphysical way of thinking about it. it it's, um, I am my parents. Exactly. Yeah. I'm an extension of them genetically, culturally, uh, as human beings, we want, I think we have a powerful urge for selfhood and independence, agency, and so on. The idea that we are merely our parents is unappealing, especially when we're young. And we spend a lot of time when we're young trying to get away from them, asserting ourselves uh, and asserting that we are not them. And as I've gotten older, I I think that's an illusion. I I am them. I'm a 
uh, and my children are me. Uh, they don't like that idea at all, I'm sure. <laughs> they're, they're 23 to 30 years old, and they assert their independence in all kinds of ways, and I, I love that they do. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing, but the truth is, um, to, to quote uh, a line of Kipling, you can't get away from the tune that they play. I mean, it's embedded in you. It's, um, again, genetically and culturally, nature and nurture work together there. And I find it actually deeply uh, comforting and um, moving to think of of the generations that way. And it's it, it's it's un American. <laughs> yeah. it's out of fashion. But I think that's so. That's why I say it. Yeah, I'm very tribal. Uh, but you know, when I think of what poetry is, I think of myself as an artist, and I'm coming into a conversation that has gone on since the beginning of human history. I mean, actually it predates history because poetry predates writing. And so I come into this conversation, which is going on, and it's gonna continue on after I'm gone. And if I'm a, gr a great poet, I can expand the conversation or refine it. And, and I, I realized after a while, that's how I think of life. You know, I'm part of this genetic human, uh, you know, continuity that goes back to ancestors I can't even imagine. But I did know my grandparents, my parents, you know, and my children. And, you know, the there's a there's a continuity between life and death, between generations, uh, you know, and we see it in, in, in genetics and we see it in the in the personalities and the values and the experiences. So if you say move on, I'll say, OK, I'll move on, but I'm taking them with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've quoted this before, but I'm going to quote it again because I like it so much. Um, it's the line from uh, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. He says, we shed as we pick up like travelers who must carry everything in their arms. And what we let fall will be picked up by those behind. The procession is very long and life is very short. We die on the march. But there is nothing outside the march, so nothing can be lost to it. The missing plays of Sophocles will turn up piece by piece or be written again in another language. Ancient cures for diseases will reveal themselves once more. Mathematical discoveries glimpsed and lost of you will have their time again. You do not suppose, my lady, that if all of Archimedes had been hiding in the great library of Alexandria, we would be at loss for a corkscrew? So... That's uh, saying something related to what you were saying. Well, you know, the, <clears throat> you know, at one, it's in the real thing uh, where Stoppard also talks about, he's talking about writing. And I think it's, I think it's actually even about writing a poem. And he's talking, he compares it to, I think, a cricket bat and about, how, you know, the, the refinement of the shape and, and, the, and the swing and things like this. And that's what a, a poet is doing. And the reward is to have your words mouthed uh, by children not yet born. Mm -hmm. And that struck me as absolutely the highest honor in poetry, you know, is to have, you know, you know people outside of your, you know, your narrow time band, you know, who, that see something of value in what you're doing. You know, when I was uh, a, a young, ambitious writer, you know, at Stanford and Harvard and, you know, tr you know, imagining how I'd make my mark, I had this, you know, very English department notion of what a poem is and its, tr its relationship to the great tradition and the history of ideas. But nowadays I think of, of what a poem is, is this uh, instrument of language that you create that is it one half a game and one half a kind of spiritual uh, exploration. But the highest thing that you can do is to be useful, is to have these words be useful to people in the, in the dilemmas of their actual lives. And if you're lucky, the, they will find uses for your poem that you don't even imagine. And so what you're, you know, and I, mean, I had a very odd thing where I, you know, wrote a poem and I, I had people talk about it in a totally different context. And I read the poem and I realized it applied to that context equally. And in fact, I rather liked 
that as much as I like my, my own, because we, homes are like children. You know, once they're out of the house, they do things that you didn't imagine and you may not approve of. But yeah. what you're trying to do is to make them able to lead independent lives. I know that sounds very odd, but uh, you know, once my poems are published, I'm simply one of the readers. I'm probably yeah. maybe the, the best informed reader, but they belong in the if they belong anywhere at all, they belong in the language and to the readers of the language. You chose um, this shabby nightclub on a foggy pier. Um, why did you pick that place to meet your cousin, the ghost of your cousin? Well, it came to me. Uh, I was, um, there was a, an artist, a very fine artist, and he was collaborating with another artist, and they were making this extraordinary book. I mean, of the, this huge large folio books with prints of jazz musicians. And they got the idea that they would ask my brother, Ted Joya, who was probably at this point, you know, if not the most famous jazz writer in the world, he's certainly the best selling jazz writer in the world. If he would write prose and I would write a poem. And I told him, I said, you know, I, you know, I've written one or two poems about jazz, but I can never write a poem, you know, that is necessarily any good. And I began thinking about it and I thinking about it. And I, then I realized it wasn't going to be about jazz. It was going to be about a world that jazz created. And then my, and my cousin's ghost came to me as it were. And I thought about going there to him. And then suddenly the poem became possible, you know, that because it was, you know, if the poem doesn't come out of an inner urgency and I realized that, you know, we had done this together and uh, you know, we had sort of, it, jazz itself was simply part of the total human experience that we had. And once I brought my cousin Philip into the poem, the whole poem became alive. And, uh, you know, I, and I knew that, you know, that it was all the ghosts. I mean, if you, if you love music, if, you know, if you love literature, most of the people you're reading are dead. Most of the people you're listening to are dead. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I would, you know, it was, you know, just read a novel by Iris Murdoch. I've been, you know, listening to Arthur Rubinstein, you know, uh, you know, play the piano. I've been listening to, to Joan Sutherland sing. These are these people that in some cases I overlapped with their lifetime and some I might not even have overlapped at all. And so what, you know, once again, it's part of this, this, you know, there's a, a, a pursuit they have in German universities called Geistesgeschichte history of the spirit. And I always loved that, this notion that you've got the history of the visible world, but you've got this thing that's somewhere between the history of ideas and and the history of sort of human consciousness that you're studying. And that's what a, any artist does, I think, is to live in, in the, the history of the spirit, which means that you have to take the things of the spirit seriously. What I was thinking, not when I first read the poem, but talking to you about it, there's a wonderful idea embedded in the poem, which is when we think of the people who are no longer with us, if we had a chance to commune with their ghosts in some fashion, and of course we can do it in our imagination, you, you did meet your cousin at the lighthouse. Uh, and can meet him anytime you want. But when we when we think about that, you can ask, where would you meet your father? Where would you meet your son? Where would you meet your friend, your cousin who's who's gone? Uh, and you could even ask the question, where would you want your great grandchildren or great great grandchildren to meet you uh, after you were gone? Um, it's finally thinking about my own father. Um, the, without thinking about it, without pondering it in a conscious way, where I would want to meet him is on a snowy street somewhere, because after a snowfall, he'd want to take a, what he would call snow walk. And we would walk in the silence of that crunching, the crunching feet in new snow and We'd go in the morning when there were no nobody was out, the cars hadn't come alive, and the streets hadn't been cleared, and the snow was still falling. 
And he loved that. And so it's not a place for me, I think, right? At least my first thought, it's, uh, it's uh, an idea. Uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a con- I don't know what you call it. Um, but it also reminds me that one of his favorite poems was The First Snowfall by James Russell Lowell, which um, mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to find it here. I'm going to read the first paragraph, the first few lines. Um, it's it's funny. I've written about this. So I'll put a link up to it. But the the opening of the poem is um, about what it's like to walk, walk in the snow. It's uh, it starts like this. The snow had begun in the gloaming and busily all the night had been heaping field and highway with a silence deep and white. Every pine and fern hemlock wore ermine too dear for an earl, and the poorest twig on the elm tree was ridged inch deep with pearl. So my dad would often recite that as we'd be walking along because it was a, a poem of his childhood. Yeah. James Russell Lowell wrote in the 19th century, lived 1819 to 1891. I'm just yeah. seeing on the web here. And that poem, which I always viewed as a beautiful poem about snow, is actually a a, a poem of tragedy. It's the, And I encourage readers to read it. It's, a, it. it's an extraordinary piece of emotional um, power. Uh, and it's about, well, I won't say it's about, but it's, it's about tragedy. Uh, but listeners, I encourage you to think about the people in your lives that you, if you've lost a dear one or a loved one, where would you meet them? And, and, and I would ask you, Dana, when you wrote this poem, and you know it's 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 lovely, but is it? Do you spend time there in your in your head at the lighthouse well, with Philip? I mean, I, I would go out with him. You know, we'd go out to dinner. We'd go out to a club. We'd go to the beach. I mean, he and he, the, you know, the two of us did things together, and and so I think of us, you know, not in the gloaming, but in the roaming. Uh, but you know. When you're talking about your father quoting the poem, my mother used to quote poems. She was a, a Mexican American woman of no great education, but I I think poetry did did two things, and I and I think it's exactly the same with your dad because I think it's the human one of the human purposes of poetry. Poetry simultaneously makes us notice things or allow, allows us to see things with fresh eyes. So, you know, your father would go out into the snow. And and he would be able to, in a sense, to re, to see it with a kind of innocence and a kind of freshness, but also it allows you to recapture uh, emotions that are somewhat difficult. I mean, it, it took, it's taken me a lifetime to understand my family. You know, I mean, I th- I think at every st- age I thought I understood them, but the older you get, the more insight you you got. And and uh, both of my parents worked. And so, uh, you know, I used to, you know, do housework with my mother. We were always working. We were always working. Not not a bad training for somebody. But my mother and I would, it would come in and she'd come in for a job. We had to clean the house. And while we cleaned the house, she would often recite poems. And um, some of the poems I liked, some of them I didn't. But I realized really it was after her death that those poems were ways of her being able to reveal emotions, reveal desires, reveal memories that she didn't really want to go to, you know, uh, directly. And, you know, so she, you know, one of her favorite poems was Annabelle Lee. You know, it was many, 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 it was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And that maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. And we loved with a love that was more than a love. I and my Annabelle Lee. A love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And when my mother was reciting this, it was beautiful to me. It put me in a trance. It put me in, it was, it cast the necessary spell that a poem does of arresting your attention, relaxing your emotions and memories and creating a special kind of temporary space of heightened uh, feeling and perception. But and that's what I was lost in. But she, what she was really 
communicating to me was this sadness that she carried about most of her life from the fact that her mother had died when she was very little. And, you know, she had an, you know, a difficult father to say the least, and that her favorite brother had died at a very early age. You know about that from studying with Miss Bishop. You know, uh, and so my mother had these sorrows that she, she only with difficulty sort of kept under control. And this allowed her to vent those things, with, in a sense, without burdening her kid. And, and so I think that, you know, poetry, you know, is this secret language of emotion uh, that is very powerful. It's not an intellectual art, really. I mean, people think of it as so intellectual, so difficult. You know, it's a very everyday uh, sort of magic that allows us to get through the crap we have to get through. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, yeah, I think especially in earlier generations, I don't know if this is fair to our parents and parents' parents, but emotion was often repressed, help beneath the surface. I'm sure for my father, poetry for him was a way to connect to his father, yeah. who had a sixth grade education, but knew much poetry and, and much Shakespeare by heart and recited it and loved ideas and loved books but had to make a living and for his family. And so I never got educated. Yeah. Well, and my, so. My, especially my Mexican grandfather only went to fourth grade. I uh, asked him why he had to quit. He said, well, when my father was murdered, um, your, my brother and I had to become cowboys. You know, they were, you know, in, in Lost Cabin, Wyoming. I wrote a poem about this in the book called The Ballad of Jesus Ortiz. But he was a cowboy a Mexican cowboy with a fourth grade education, you know, sort of bilingual. And he knew dozens of poems by heart because cowboys would sit around the fire and they would recite poems, they would sing songs, and they would tell stories. And so I look at this thing and that's why I have never believed uh, what I was taught at Stanford and Harvard, that poetry was an elite intellectual uh, form of language. You know. It, it can be that because, you know, poetry is simply a, a special way of using words so that they are heard and read in a special way. And you can do anything you want in poetry, but the bulk of great poems have been works that are pretty accessible to, you know, any alert, uh, intelligent person, you know, which I think is you know, a substantial num amount of humanity. It was sort of funny. I, as you know, I wrote years ago an article called Can Poetry Matter? It was published in the Atlantic Monthly. And to the astonishment of everyone, including myself, it generated more mail than any article in the history of the Atlantic Monthly. And they didn't even put it on the cover, but it, it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds. And this is when people actually had to write letters. Yeah. And I, there was many of them that were there, but my favorite of all the letters that, you know, that came from, I mean, people in the military, you know, everything else. And, uh, and was a woman who was on a ranch and she said that she, she had three sons and poetry was always important to her. And she sacrificed a lot to get her kids educated. And it disappointed her that poetry didn't really matter to any of her sons. And then she said the thing that really struck me. She goes, she's always loved poems and she knows them by many by heart. And she goes, some days I stand at the sink and a poem is the only thing that gets me through the day. And I just love that image because it's, it's in the, you know, the, our sorrows tend to come in the ordinary moments of our lives. And, you know, and, and poetry is a kind of magic you know, to turn, to turn a sorrow in, into a memory, a, you know, a memory of value uh, or a, a sorrow that triggers and you can recapture the emotions that led you to that person or whatever. But I do, you know, I do th that person or that place uh, to your, to your own mortality. I, I do think, um, when we think about what we didn't pass on to our children, which I think about from time to time, I did not teach my children. I did not expose my children 
to much opera. I love opera. Opera is a huge part of my emotional yeah. um, life. And yet, for a variety of reasons, it just it didn't become important. And I think about it. It's interesting. I I knew some opera when I was younger, say, before I went off to college. And my dad would harangue me to listen to more opera after I got out of college. And I just found it tedious and not interesting. And and uh, he sent me at one point a cassette of uh, Leontine Price singing Madame Butterfly. And uh, I got hooked. Yeah. <laughs> I got totally. Puccini will do it. Yeah, uh, he's he cheats. Um, so if you're out there listening and you're not an opera fan or you've never been exposed to it, you can start with La Boheme or Man of Butterfly. And yeah. you can actually listen to it profitably without a libretto, without the words. Just close your eyes and listen to a great voice. Um, you know, I, I, had t I have two sons. And the older one, I used to take to the opera all the time. Because I was a reviewer at that point, music reviewer. And my wife, you know, she'd like to go you know, once or twice a season. And so I take my son. And, you know, he loved going because he'd go to San Francisco or to Washington or into New York. And, and we'd have a very nice dinner and we'd do it. He doesn't listen to opera. The younger one, whom I never took, is the you know, <laughs> likes opera. You know, so you know it's so maybe there was some well, osmosis there. It's a but nah, I, I think love, it's you know, <laughs> no, I, I loved classical music, but I I didn't like opera because it I think it was the language barrier and the period barrier. And I was actually a student in Vienna, and there was an American girl uh, who was also there, and I think Sue had a, a crush on me, and she was an attractive girl, but you know, a little difficult, I thought. And she said she bought, you know, she wanted to buy tickets to La Boheme and we went. And I think she was assuming that we would go to the opera and fall in love. And I did fall in love, but with Puccini. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, I listened to La Boheme and it was like, where has this been all my life? And then I started going standing room to the opera. I, we sat with, I sat with Sue uh, and I began to go once a week, twice a week. And by the time I was, I was in the Vienna, I was going three or four nights a week. Because you could go for, you could do standing room for 60 cents. And, uh, <laughs> and I developed a bankruptingly expensive habit in the, for the United States, which is one of the reasons why I'm glad I was a reviewer and later the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, because they gave me great tickets for free. <laughs> but what I was going to argue, I, I was going to claim, and I, I, that opera was, thing was a digression for me, is that I think for most modern listeners, um, most people listening to this conversation, our poets have been replaced by our songwriters. And it is songs that we sing at the sink rather than poems that we recite at the sink. Um, you know, so many of our, because of the extraordinary time we live in, there are many challenges about living in this time, but one of the greatest things about this time is the extraordinary richness of music that we have available to us yeah. for close to free. Well, so in that, the old days, if you wanted to relive your, your youth, you'd have to take out an LP if you had it and play it. You might, it might be scratched and it might be broken and gone. But today you can access all the songs of your youth instantly. And um, they can make me cry. I can, I can hear, you know, songs from, um, from my adolescence or my, my 20s and there's so much emotion that i was felt at the time when i was listening to those songs in real time that i still tap into that and there's there's a sense of loss there's a sense of sometimes fulfillment a sense of um the power of youth that that's now, now Russ, uh, you, you probably think you're going off topic but <laughs> you're not because <laughs> poetry and song were the same art if you go back to, you know, like Latin, what's the word for poem? It's Carmen, you know, like the name of the, you know, of the operatic title character. A Carmen is a song. It's a poem. It's a magic spell. And it's a prophecy. And, and that's because they're, they're all interrelated. You know, the prophets were poets. I mean, if you look at the prophetic books of the Old Testament, uh, you know, it, they're in verse. Because verse is the is the medium, poetry is the medium for prophecy. And my conception of poetry, and this is what makes me very different 
for most of my contemporaries, especially at least my literary contemporaries, people that are writing poems in the in a uh, in the grand tradition, let us say, is that my poems are meant to be heard. And I think Frost's poems were meant to be heard. Certainly Shakespeare's were meant to be heard because he never wrote, you know, he never published the texts. They existed in performance. And my poems can be read, I think, with great profit on the page, uh, but they come alive when they're heard. And I think that's the nature of poetry. It is an, it's related to music and to song. Uh, about half the work I do nowadays is writing words for music. You know, I've written the libretti for four operas, and actually today, uh, Laurie Leitman, this great com uh, composer that I work with, Laurie and I made a, a deal with, with Kansas City Opera to write, not, to write a children's opera for them. And I, now, I don't think that that is at all uh, you know, outside the mainstream of what a poet does. You know, if you go back to the Renaissance, this is when, when I quit my job, I worked for 15 years and I wrote at night. And and, and I, my wife was saying, well, you know, she supported what, whatever I wanted to do. And I said, if I just wanted to write books of poetry, then, you know, I could have had a full-time job and, you know, written in the e evening and the weekends the way that Wallace Stevens did. But I wanted to write you know, verse plays and songs and essays. I wanted a Victorian kind of career. And so anyway, uh, you know, I believe that a poem is language raised to the level of song. Do you want to hear another poem? I do, but I want, before, before that, I want to, I want to stick with Meet Me at the Lighthouse for a few more minutes. Yes. Um, Uh, you didn't say, ha, have you, did you go to that jazz club with your cousin? Yes. When he was alive? Yes. That's okay, why, so were, that's why it's, it's the, you know, that's the connection that I had between jazz and, you know, a, a, an, an emotion that, you know, motivated a poem. So I, I want to talk, if if you're comfortable, we don't have to talk about your cousin, but I, I want to talk about this longing we have um, for people who are gone. I There's a, a song by Mark Knopfler that uh, he wrote. It's called Piper, to, A Piper to the End. And a piper is a bagpipe player of bagpipes. And your poem reminded me of his song. I've got a couple examples I want to share, and we can we can talk about them. Um, Mark Knopfler never met his uncle. His uncle died at twenty in World War One, and he was a piper. It's a very unmilitary way to be a soldier. He was a mm -hmm. a bagpiper in in the army. Um, which was still imaginable in, I guess, 1914. And this is how, I, I don't know if I'm allowed by copyright to sing the song uh, or recite the entire uh, lyrics. So I'm just going to recite the first verse on, on the basis of Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a fair a, use. The whole, the whole, when you do the whole thing, you get into trouble, but I'm sure you could excerpt yeah. it at length. Yeah, I'm going to ex excerpt it. Um, and so imagine... Mark Knopfler, who's I think a great writer, um, he's uh, he's best known for Dire Straits, but I think his solo career as a songwriter is spectacularly magnificent. And th I'm going to sing um, the first line, and then I'll I'll finish reading the first verse without the song. But uh, I, I can't help but sing a bit of it. It goes like this. <clears throat> When I leave this world behind me to another, I will go. And if there are no pipes in heaven, 
I'll be going down below. So that's that's the first start, which is yeah. amazing. He says, you know, he's a piper. And so if there aren't bagpipes in heaven, he's going to hell. He's going he's gonna to re refuse at the entrance. <laughs> and he assumes he's going to heaven, which I love. Um, the, the next part I'll just recite of the first verse. He says, if friends in time be severed, someday we will meet again. I'll return to leave you never. Be a piper to the end. And the rest of it's about what it's like to, the next few verses are gorgeous. They're about what it's like to die in battle, which Mark Knopfler imagines. But the, the idea that that our friends are never lost, that our loved ones, that we'll see them again, that we will return to leave you never, um, is such a powerful human desire. And in, in my, I, think, I think a lot of us, religious or not, hold on to that idea, even if we might think rationally that it isn't going to happen. But I wanted to talk for a minute about how the world has changed. And in the 19th century, surely it was much more commonly believed that there was more to life than this world, uh, that there was a heaven, uh, a world to come that would allow us to be reunited with the people we love because the thought that we are not with them is unbearable. So we, we hold on to this hope. Um, people go to their, um, to the graves of their loved ones and talk to them. Um, and how that view is out of, you know, it's out of fashion, uh, as you were suggesting earlier. And I wonder, I think about how that changes, if at all, how we live this life. Uh, I'm a religious Jew. Judaism does have an afterlife, although uh, a lot of people think it doesn't. Uh, it does have an idea of an afterlife, but it's definitely muted relative to Christianity. Um, the, in, in, in the Jewish uh, theology, uh, the afterlife is much less spoken of. It's much less the focus, and there's an enormous focus on, um, on this world. And um, but certainly in Christianity, it's 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 a little the 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 weights are different, and I think as religious belief has receded in the West, I wonder how that affects uh, how we live. Well, you know, if I if I can say something that doesn't seem too con uh, contradictory, it's go ahead. You know, it, it, if you're religious, and you know, it, which means a huge range of possible things. You, you know, you have a sense of a mythos, you know, of a heaven, hell, the birth, the death, of immortality, et cetera, et cetera. And you can believe in these as objective supernatural realities. Uh, but you, but even if you don't believe those, you have to acknowledge that if humanity has kept them through all these ages, as the central way of understanding the human experience, then there's a psychological human reality to them. And, you know, I absolutely believe that uh, heaven, whether it exists in the afterlife or not, also simultaneously exists in the present moment in the same way that hell does, in the same way that the dead do. And, uh, and, I did not think that going into poetry, but having spent a half a century now as somebody dedicated to poetry, a poet creates th that carmen, that poem, that song, that spell, that prophecy. If the poem is good, I cast a spell over you. And what's the most uh, you know notorious kind of spell? Necromancy, a poem that summons the dead. And what I can do, and, I, and I'll tell you, I've seen this with audiences. I'll create a poem, like this poem I, 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 I want to read next about my mother. It's about, you know, this little thing of, you know, probably not, not a big thing in Jerusalem, Christmas ornaments, uh, <laughs> but uh, how putting these ornaments on summons up this spirit. If I read that to an audience, 
people come after me, up to me. They say, I like that poem, and then begin talking about the memories that it resurrected of their their mother, their grandmother. And that's what the spell, if the spell, if, if a poem is any good, it says everything you intend to say and all these secrets that you don't even know about. And it's that simultaneous, it's a metaphysical sense of life that you have the material and the, and the uh, immaterial, the spiritual, you have the temporal and the eternal, you have the visible and invisible. I live a life rich in this beautiful visual place I live in, but it's also rich in the invisible things that are around me. And why would you want to lead a life without the metaphysical, without the invisible, uh, you know, without, you know, some tangible connection? Now, whether it's real or not, you know, who, which of us can say, but the traditions that we come out of and a Catholic, which I am, comes out of out of a Jewish tradition. Ultimately, everyone that created Catholicism was Jewish. Uh, uh, so presumably is God, you know, <laughs> if you take it you know, literally. So we're part of this continuity that has believed in these things as urgent spiritual truths. Whether they're literal or, or metaphorical, it doesn't matter. They're still true and they're necessary. Yeah, before before you read the poem, I just want to mention that I, I was I've recently discovered that there is a strong view in physics, not universally held, uh, that time is an illusion, that there is no past or present or future, in the sense that we understand that there's no that the things that happened that that we think of as in the past are, are in some sense concurrent, which means that no one is truly dead. Well, They're and, just and not that, reachable. That is a definition of something coming from the other side. That is what mysticism is. Mm -hmm. You know, every tradition has this kind of little corner saying that there's a there are some people who have these moments in which go outside of time, go outside of out of place, and everything you know the the you know the the universe implodes upon this, and the, and as it were, you know, which is also very Jewish, uh, you know, in terms of in terms of these things, and it's indescribable in the language of time, in the language of of temp, of uh, finitude. There's a wonderful poem by Borges called Matthew twenty five thirty, where uh, you know Borges is in the uh, the train station uh, in Buenos Aires and the train pulls the whistle, you know, the old deafening train whistles. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he hears in that train whistle the single word by which God created the world. You know, this, you know, it, which comes out of Jewish mysticism. And then he tries to explain what it is. And it's a, one of the great poems of the 20th century. And he just gives this long list of of things that it could be in a family because the blood of heroes is is, is through your veins uh, uh you have uh you have wasted the years and they have wasted you and still and still you have not written the poem and it's this wonderful I mean, it's, you know a great poem but it's, but it's a poem about the, the the mystical experience which is by definition you know uh illustrates the the theoretical physics that you know may or you know that you're you're talking about yeah I, i'm the person who told who told me this is says there's, there are people who don't think it's so but um it's just an interesting thing to to imagine let's hear the poem about your mother what's the title well this is a it's a fairly short poem it the the time if you know that you know uh when Jesus was born, the three magi, the three kings came from the east, and they brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These, you know, these, you know, these three gifts. And this poem, which is a, 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 a it's a poem about my, my mother, but it's a Christmas poem called Tinsel, Frankincense, and Fir. F-I-R. <laughs> uh, I realized there's a, a 
an allusion, a term in this poem that you and I know, uh, which is dime store, but nobody under 50 knows, you know, you know, the kind of, you know, my mother could only afford to buy the cheapest of anything. And after, you know, your parents die, you inherit all their stuff and you hate to throw anything out because you somehow are, you know, so I have all these, these God awful Christmas ornaments that, you know, that she had. The, the dime store, the dime store has been replaced by the dollar store because of yeah. inflation. It's so been, listeners probably know what a dollar store is, but a dime store, you know, it's also a, it was, it was, um, Woolworths was called the five and dime. Yeah. Newberry's, the, Woolworths, uh, uh, you know, Crest, the five, five and 10 cent stores, you know. Yeah. Where you could buy inexpensive things, uh, yeah. for everyday yeah. people. Yeah. And so the people would buy tinsel, frankincense, and fur. Hanging old ornaments on a fresh cut tree. I take each red glass bulb and tinfoil serif and blow away the dust. Anyone else would throw them out. They are so scratched and shabby. My mother had so little joy to share. She kept it in a box to hide away. But on the darkest winter nights, voila, she opened it resplendently to shine. How carefully she hung each thread of tinsel or touched each dime store bobble with delight. Blessed by the frankincense of fragrant fur, nothing was too little to be loved. Why do the dead insist on bringing gifts we can't reciprocate? We wrap her hopes around the tree, crowned with a fragile star. No holiday is holy without ghosts. Well, that's magnificent. That's fairly, really beautiful. Um, you know, it's, you know, and so my mother was a, 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 a loved her great, you know, wildly, but she was a brilliant difficult woman who'd had, you know, never had a chance to, you know, to do anything with, with her talents. And, uh, but, you know, and I, and I, I think I, uh, you know, I tried to capture that, but most of it is about, you know, these things we hold on to because they, they reconnect us, you know, with people we love and they may be kind of awkward things, uh, or, you know, secret things. Longfellow, you know, uh, you know, has this poem, you know, he lost, you know, both of his wives, you know, one in childbirth and one in this horrific fire. Uh, and, you know, he has this poem called Holidays. And, it, and one line is, is talking about, there's, you know, these public holidays, but there's also the secret holidays of the heart. You know, these days that things happened that are very important to us, but no one but us and perhaps, you know, our spouse or uh, knows about. My wife and I, you know, lost our first child. You know, none of his, neither of his brothers knew, knew him. Uh, and he's incredibly important to us. And we still cherish his memory, which has gone from being a sad memory to kind of a joyful memory. Because, you know, we had kids thinking we were going to, it was sort of a burden. And we realized it was a delight. Mm -hmm. uh, but only my wife and I, this, you know, it's part of the secret language that you speak with people you love. Actually, I'd like us to close with, um, if you could read it again, a lot of listeners uh, found it very powerful, The Marriage of Many Years, which you I'll read the first to. time. Yeah, and this is um, I, I want to add a comment after it, and then we, we can talk a little bit about it again. Uh, um, in my book, 99 Poems, you know, I was publishing my selected poems, uh, you know, oh, I don't know, about four years ago, I think it was five years ago. And I wanted to end the book on a poem to my wife, you know, because I don't tend to write about my, my you know, my family, because I don't want to, you know, to make their lives public. But I, I wanted to write a poem, you know, basically about how much uh, she meant to me, 
And and I was trying to think of the 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 right metaphor for an enduring love. And I think it's language. When you love someone, when you spend a lifetime with someone, the two of you create a private language. And it is the most intimate form of communication you'll ever have with anyone in the world. But it's very fragile because if you lose the person, Who do you speak the language with? And it reminded me of these California Indian tribes, which only have one or two living speakers. And when that person dies, the language dies, the songs die, the the dances die. And does that mean that that culture was not worth anything? No, it's just that, you know, it's, it's destiny in a way. All of us are mortal. So everyone will lose... You know the you know uh, the language that they share with their beloved marriage, and yet it's happy. It's a joyful thing, uh, and so I mean you know, and I think it's all the more joyful for understanding its finitude. Marriage of many years. Most of what happens happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin, warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time could not break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in sovereign secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. My guest today has been Dana Joya. Dana, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's been a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.